All right. And if you're just hopping in, we'll wait until a critical mass of folks pop into the virtual space and then we'll jump right in. But if you're already here, hi, nice to see you. Welcome. So we're live and we're just, uh... oh, I see the counter. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's focus on that all night, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, don't focus, focus on, a, on the height and then you should like put a little tape because like if two people leave, your reaction will be, why did two people leave? <laughs> that is true. All hey. right, let's go ahead and dive in. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Lauren Huff and Elizabeth McCracken discussing leaving isn't the hardest thing. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions during the last portion of tonight's discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. And before we dive in, we do wanna sincerely thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. As an adult, Lauren Huff has had many identities, an airman in the US Air Force, a cable guy, a bouncer at a gay club. As a child, however, she had none. Growing up as a member of the infamous cult, the Children of God, Huff had her own self robbed from her. The cult took her all over the globe, to Germany, Japan, Texas, Chile, but it wasn't until she finally left for good that Lauren understood she could have a life beyond the family. Along the way, she's loaded up her car and started over, trading one life for the next. She's taken pilgrimages to the sites of her youth, been kept in solitary confinement, dated a lot of women, dabbled in drugs, and eventually found herself as what she always wanted to be, a writer. Here, as she sweeps through the underbelly of America, relying on friends, family, and strangers alike, she begins to excavate a new identity even as her past continues to trail her and color her world, relationships, and perceptions of self. Leaving isn't the hardest thing interrogates our notions of ecstasy, queerness, and what it means to live freely. Each piece is a reckoning of survival, identity, and how to reclaim one's past when carving out a future. Huff will be in conversation with Elizabeth McCracken, author of seven books, including The Souvenir Museum, Bowl Away, Thunderstruck and Other Stories, and The Giant's House. She has served on the faculty at the Iowa Writers Workshop and currently holds the James Missioner Chair for Fiction at the University of Texas at Austin. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Lauren Huff and Elizabeth McCracken. Thank you both. Hey, Lauren. You're muted. I know, I did. I realized I was making a whole lot of noise during the introduction. It's the second one of these I've done. <laughs> Unlike everyone else in a pandemic, I have this great job where I nobody Zoomed me. It's been terrific. Oh, but man. yeah, <laughs> I made so, some early mistakes. It's really lovely to see you. It's um, so good to see you. I'm, I'm going to dive in. Okay. Um, we, you and I first met on Twitter, even though we were living in Austin at the same time. Yeah. And I feel like you were, you're one of those rare people who, you are an excellent writer and you're an excellent writer on Twitter. Like I knew when I started reading your tweets that anything you wrote would be fantastic. Um, and so when I started reading this book, um, admittedly my first thought was like, oh, thank heavens, it's as good as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, heartbreaking and awkward if it had only been like good um and then as I read further I realized it was I mean didn't take me that far into it to realize it's a magnificent book it's like nothing I've ever read and I feel like my um my ability to imagine it was was faulty I and again I had really high expectations um and for anybody who follows Lauren on Twitter it's something like the book that I think people would imagine that you would write um, uh, based on your tweets, but it's also deeper and wider and stranger. Um, and uh, so my first question, because we're friends, 
And the last time I saw you, you were depositing a cat in a pillowcase on my front walk in the middle of March in 2020. Um, yep. is, uh, hey, Lauren, how's it going? <laughs> how's it's, your uh, publication going? It's It's been absolutely wild. I think I did. I don't know. I think it's the greatest thing about Twitter is you can talk to other people who've been through this already. So when I'm cycling through every possible emotion every hour and napping like a trucker to avoid them, um, you can just ask about it. And every writer's like, oh yeah, that's, you got a good three months of that. And then it doesn't go away, but you get used to it. So yeah, that's been helpful. That's, that's how I've been. Um, this part's kind of fun. I, not, the problem with all this is none of it seems real because it's all just pictures on screens and it's very disconnected. Like I've never met my editor. You read how people publish books and there's, you go to New York at some point. Um, maybe you meet your editor at some point. I, I had no idea what he looks like. I love him a lot. Couldn't tell you what he looks like. But like you, I know, so this is fucking cool. Yeah, I, I hate to tell you this, that like you get normally free travel and some free meals and free hotel rooms. I love hotel rooms. I love shampoo bottles. I steal all of them. I have no shame about it either. No, no, who would? I mean, just the, yeah. yeah. Why would you? I'm, I'm a- uh, I love hotels. Me too. I'm sorry that, that the, the hotels will be there for you. I'm sorry <laughs> for you. I mean, that's the hope. So, yeah. Um, so I want to I wanna ask you about voice. Um, I've been in the writing game for a while, and I'm still not sure what voice is. It's something that people like to ask about. Um, but I feel like I would... I would recognize your sentences anywhere, that they're, they're distinctive and beautiful and funny. And um, my question is, is that, do you start knowing what the sentences are gonna be like? Um, do you start with, one of the children has just let the cat into the room, by the way, <laughs> I look behind me. Um, do, you, do you know, um, what, what comes first when you start to write an essay? What comes first? Uh, a lot of them, I think, have started with just a root sentence. Um, the uh, the cable guy essay is probably the most glaring one. I was talking to I was talking to other cable guys that I used to know, and I'm like I don't even remember ten years. And at some point, I said, "Well, I, I just remember needing to pee," and so that that's kind of where that one started. Um, the, the last essay in the book just started with, I was gonna use that goddamn giraffe in a field if my life depended on it. Like that is, that is a really free, cool metaphor. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Senate, I, I don't know. It took me a really long time and it took me until I started writing this. Um, and the cable guy says, really, I think where everything clicked where I just, if I just wrote like I was telling it to you, I didn't edit at all, didn't add periods where they shouldn't, where I wouldn't put them in a sentence. All of my weird asides where I forget what I was telling you the story about originally and move on, I put all of those in there and then it was just taking 99% of them out mm -hmm. um, to frame it. But yeah, that's when writing feels good. When it sucks, you're just writing sentences and they're not much fun. I have to say, I love the digressions. Like I was looking again at that first essay and the way it loops around and it's thrilling and it's not, um, the, the, sh the shapes of your sentences are interesting, but the shapes of the essays too, they feel, again, they feel like they're just yours. Um, were you writing stuff before you started writing these essays? I know you made a, an attempt at a memoir. Yeah, I made an attempt at a memoir. It didn't sound anything like me. Um, I was writing a lot of what I thought people wanted to read about it. Um, and there wasn't any point to it. 
it felt like trauma porn. Um, there wasn't, I wasn't saying anything. I was just telling stories. Um, and there's no point to it unless someone was just like curious and wanted to look. Um, yeah, it wasn't, I, I hated it. Um, I tried to write fiction before that. I always sound exactly like the last person I read. So it's just a great way to learn writing, but eventually you got to stop doing that and sound like you. So uh, when I started writing these, it started sounding a little bit more like me kind of with every draft. Unfortunately, one of those drafts was a bit more that didn't sell, but essays turned out to be a lot more fun. So. Do you, do you have a notion of what makes them, like what makes them fun and what makes them different? Yeah, you play so much more with structure. Yeah, I can tell you a story about a car being torched. And at the same time, I can tell you the history of the children of God. Um, I, I can tell you what it's like to be gay in the military. I can tell you so many different things and add, yeah, you're, you you can play around with the structure a lot more. I think I think in a novel you would get lost, where in an essay it's it's short enough where the digressions kind of work if you reel them in back in fast enough. So I I also I mean one of the things that I love about your voice is that there are wisecracks and there are metaphors. There's advice. There's that line about if you ever <laughs> if anybody uses the word you're that you're like family here at a job interview run away as fast as you can um and i and i feel like that like all the pieces are doing a ton of things at a time um my, my next question is something that i bet you get asked about a lot which is the book is full of genuine darkness and sadness and it's also really funny and I wonder how you think those two things work together. I think that's just the way my brain connects them. Um, yeah, it, the hardest I laughed recently was burying my dog. But it was really, we scared the shit out of a pizza dude. Um, we thought it was my niece standing behind me and my niece's husband, Carl and I were, you know, trying to figure out head and legs and did he poop and <laughs> guy walks off and we realize it wasn't my niece and Carl looked at me and was like at no point did we say the word dog <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it's really funny it's the worst thing that's happened to me in a long time but it's funny like those that yeah if you're writing about it I don't think it takes away from what happened to insert the jokes you would honestly tell at the time even if you didn't have that reflex at the time still thinking about it and retelling it you think of it's funny tragedy is hilarious but it is yeah I don't I don't believe in God but if I did it would be because life makes really terrible jokes <laughs> Any ones, like this at the moment not when you're retelling it but at the moment that the synopsis of your memoir yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty, pretty much yeah god that's a good memoir hey thanks um yeah that's one of the weird things yeah people keep apologizing for liking the book like but you better like it. I worked really hard on that. Do you understand? That's not easy. What I just did. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they really do like because they apologize because yeah, they're like, I'm, I'm sorry. I know, but I really loved it, and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't this wasn't a sharing session in AA. Like I wrote a book. <laughs> it's okay to like it. Yeah, it would be awful if nobody read it and nobody liked it. And then yeah. they just apologize to you anyhow. <laughs> well, there's there's that nightmare. Um, but it seems, I mean, it, if you don't mind me saying, it does, it seems like it's getting wonderful attention. And 
can be on NPR more than once. Yeah, they made me cry today. <gasps> Did they really? Yeah. So I was so worried about dropping an F bomb on NPR. I'd forget to worry about their really, there's a reason they're working for NPR. Yeah, she made me cry. <laughs> so my dad's going to listen to that. Yeah. But yeah, it's been fun. Um, I don't know. It's getting, I have no gauge for this. This is, I do. I've probably asked you a hundred times. I know I've asked a lot of people, like I, they'll start congratulating me. And I'm like, I don't know if you're being nice or if that's a good thing. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have no gauge for whether or not something matters in the grant. Who knows what fucking sells a book? I don't know. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's no way to know, but it's meaningful that people that people have read it and they want other people to read it. That to me like is the, the I, I saw a little bit of your conversation um, with your NPR interviewer on Twitter and what she said, she talked about how meaningful the book was but she also said she bought a bunch of copies for other people. And that to me is like, that's the best compliment there can be. Yeah, you know, last night, I've talked to him like once or twice. He popped into my DMs and I recognized his name and like couldn't quite place it. And uh, I'd got, who's this kid who was in my Vietnamese class at DLI. Wow. And uh, we were sort of friends. We hung out sometimes. We'd drink on the beach together. And he was, just, I don't know, he was one of those really fucking nice guys that you don't date because you're fucking dumb as shit and 19 or a lesbian. But yeah, he popped into my DMs and he said he'd finished the book and that he was, he's like, I bought a copy to keep on my shelf. He's a teacher now. And he's like, for, for those gay kids who ask if, if there's a, if I know any queer authors. And it was the coolest fucking thing. It made me cry so much. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, those kind of things feel like they matter a lot. Yeah, they do. I have to say now that I've heard that two people have made you cry, I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay is that the bar <laughs> no god <laughs> don't don't <laughs> if I, already, I don't think you make me cry i think i'm just a crier these days i think i've cried yeah i haven't cried in front of you before <sighs> well i mean that's so the the book is about it's about a lot of things that your average reader won't have gone through um like being a cable guy um, being, going through a, a military trial, um, growing up in, in a cult, but it's also about a lot of stuff that everyone experiences, um, but that don't get written about a lot. I feel like it's about the awkwardness of sexual longing. People write about <laughs> sexual longing, but they don't write about, you know, the pure awkwardness of it. Um, my favorite, my favorite line in the whole thing is about the woman, and then she began to grind on my forearm because that's what you do when you're in love. Just so beautiful and hilarious and tender. So it's about that. It's about money um, and the lack of it and how it shapes everybody's life. Um, some much more. Um, bluntly than other people's. And it, it's also, there's a lot about shame and exposure in the book in a way that is really moving and interesting. Um, I guess I, I wonder whether you can talk both about the varieties of shame that, that, are, that are in the book, which are a lot of which are about the fear of exposure um, and being seen unkindly by strangers and whether that feels, how that feels now that you're, that the exposure is that people are reading your words about those, those events in your life. I, I don't know that I know how I feel about people reading it. Um, I don't, I don't think I've really comprehended that yet. But uh, I, mean, I 
think the process of writing it takes a whole lot of the staying out of it. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't mean just, you know, your late night scribbling in a notebook, really secretive diary stage of writing. I mean, <laughs> sending it to an editor 20 times to argue about a sentence that I know it doesn't make sense, but I want it there. <laughs> um like unless this is illegal can i just keep it in the book it's fine um yeah i it it's weird those things we carry around forever living in austin was three different times when i'm working on a patio i heard people tell someone else on the patio they grew up in a cult and i'm always like wait what who you (laughs) um which one and then we do the which cult we were in and then we would go our own way. But we walk around with these deep, dark secrets and nobody gives a shit. Like, those are just the things that, I don't know, they keep you from making friends. They, And it's a form of control they put on us when we were kids. Instill shame and you can control someone. That's why, that's why everybody employs confession is a big part of the religion you have to confess you have to apologize you have to everything is shameful and something that is on you yeah i don't know gosh i'd never thought of that and then also the person that you've told it to also knows of your shame which is yeah do something with yeah they never they never take the shame away from you in the whole confession, punishment, apology, ritual. The shame is never removed. You're still supposed to feel bad about it. But, and yes, yeah, so that's that's a pretty easy way to have some power over someone. I, I don't know. I've clearly thought a lot about it. Wrote a whole book. Yeah. Have you heard from a... Uh, other people from your who who recognize your name and and appear in the book yeah I mean mean, Jay's in touch a lot Jay is just mad that Julia Roberts didn't volunteer to do his (laughs) audiobook which he considers his (laughs) audiobook but of course well he has one essay that he's just claimed as his um yeah, he's always been around that. My boss from, from Badlands called me today. So that was pretty cool. He's spent most of the time bitching that he had to call four people he didn't like to get my phone number. Um, but yeah, then he cried a little bit. I think we just become criers at a certain age. I don't know. Joey Oldacker was crying. That was wild. Um, <laughs> not, yeah. It's something about you, Lauren, because... I'm older than you and I've got a cast iron heart. See, this is why you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be like you, Elizabeth. I'm going to avoid a- AWP for my entire career and I'm going to stop crying. Biggest piece of advice, yeah. I'm Not gonna to stop f- crying. I, <laughs> it feels like a neurological thing in either year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, like, I know what it is, but it doesn't mean my therapist is always right. <laughs> <laughs> you just be a crier. It's fine. Yeah, no, it's. There are worse traits. Speaking of which, so what's your, <laughs> what's your, so you didn't have segues like this on NPR. Um, I really did. <laughs> What's your relationship to Twitter these days? Ah, <laughs> uh, weren't we supposed to have cocktails for this? I have a cocktail. Are you drinking? Yeah, I'm in the attic. Yeah, uh, that's I. Super healthy, the lifestyle that I'm living right now. Um, yeah, and. I was up late and my neighbors fucking leaf blower should be a felony. Um, which is the thing that you can say on Twitter. And generally people agree with me. Um, 
Yeah, I, 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 I get in trouble with Twitter sometimes, but I, it's also how I have a career. Um, and then I don't know, we're all fucking lonely during the pandemic. So I think I shared a little bit too much and I'm dealing with Teddy dying and people are giving me all sorts of advice that's going to make him better. And then you, I don't think you understand what's happening here. Um, no matter how many times I tell you what's happening here. Um, They're still going to suggest pumpkin? Yep. They're going to suggest pumpkin every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm having to pull back a little bit from it. Um, I, I tried to commit career suicide a couple weeks ago by hyping independent bookstores and asking people not to buy my stuff on Amazon because I, I think you know my name because I wrote an essay about needing to pee because I was driving around in a work van. And uh, that backfired and more people liked the book. This latest career suicide worked better. Um, not dead yet though. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I won. It sucks and it gets scary and you start feeling like the entire world is against you because that's what it feels like on Twitter. And especially now when you don't, I had to come over here to play with a dog to like fix my brain and the world is not on Twitter. That's a hundred people who are really online. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it'll, it's, it, it can do real harm. So yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the balance. We all are. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to me because, you know, publishers often say, oh, it's important for writers to be on Twitter. And I don't think it makes any difference unless you're good at it and that there's some aspect of it, of it that you enjoy. And I, I feel like I don't think it ever elevates anybody who's not an amazing writer, but I do think of you as somebody like who became one of the, a, a well-known writer before your first book because you were so wild. good at writing on Twitter. Yeah, that part's kind of wild. I mean, it doesn't rate anywhere with like my brother when I yell, I'm a respected writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> it does does nothing he just laughs which is kind of the point um my late mother used to come to readings that i gave and would heckle me i mean like, <laughs> <laughs> oh god she said so every story you tell <laughs> makes me love her more <laughs> be great um yeah I, I, I don't know i don't remember what the question was What's no it was, question? it was about it was about yeah. twitter and uh, i feel yeah. like you're a handful of, of really interesting writers who I, I know about them because they're great on Twitter. And um, as I say, I think it's really good that your book more, fulfill, more than fulfills anybody's considerable expectations based on, on Twitter. Well, that's a fucking relief. <laughs> um. <laughs> Lauren, as I said, it was for me personally too. Like, not. A, <laughs> I'm sure it is for you, but it really. I was. I was. There's that feeling when you read a book that you've been waiting for for a long time. Um, as I feel like I was. I was waiting for leaving isn't the hardest thing, and um, and and yeah, and to have your mind blown by it, which is which was my experience of reading this. I think I wrote to you halfway through. Yeah. Because I was supposed to be doing other things. <laughs> so <laughs> goddamn nice of you, by the way. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I think Brandon, Ty Brandon Taylor, I don't know why I keep calling him Brandon Tyler. Uh, yeah, Brandon Taylor hit the nail on the head when we were talking on Saturday at the last event. And he said, it's it only works if you treat it like community. Um. And I think that's the big difference. You can even be really good at tweeting, but if you're not 
if you're not there to just hang out with the rest of us when things are really boring, and I don't mean that you have to be online all the time, but it needs to, that needs to be what you're doing on Twitter a lot of the time, not promoting yourself, not, you know, yeah, it's, if it feels like community and like, it turns out there's a place earnestly pays, like being earnest, I don't know what the fuck word I just said, yeah, it's, you can be earnest on there. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it's fine. You'd be genuinely excited about shit. I mean, Shameless Blackley has how many followers? Because he's super excited about yeast. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdest I guy. Person, I'm afraid. The guy, he invented the Xbox, but that's not why anybody or built the first one. I don't know. It was a cool thing about Xbox. I'm not a gamer. I'm sorry if you're watching this, dude. Like, I, um, he had something to do with the Xbox, but yeah, he collects um ancient yeast from like Egyptian pots and makes bread with it, and is all nerdy and scientific about it. And he's basically teaching Twitter how to make bread. This was pre pandemic, by the way, too. Um, so we're like, I knew them before you did. Um, <laughs> a hipster about yeast, but uh, yeah, he's if you're genuinely interested in the thing that you're interested in, you'll find your weird tribe. That was always kind of the promise of the internet, wasn't it? It works on Twitter. And if you've got any inclination to be the person who's like, I heard about that person before you did, Twitter is the place to be. Brandon Taylor, amazing writer, Booker Shortlist. I've known him since before he went to graduate school on Twitter. I don't know him, yeah. but he's another person who's like exceptionally good at Twitter and it like radiates out into his fiction. Yeah. And not, he's weirdly esoteric and into some strange shit. I, but I love following him because he's, he's Brandon. You know yeah. that that's really him. Yeah. You're not surprised at all when you meet him. You're not, when you see his face, that, that is always, that was always who Brandon was going to be. And he's perfect. Yeah. He might be, he might be tweeting about first person narrators and he might be <laughs> tweeting about Leslie Fielding and he might be tweeting about the tutors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he goes, or just his sweater. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be his Carol sweater all the time. One of the reasons that I love Twitter is because a super brilliant fiction writer can tweet about the Tudors with a pair of looking askance emo- eyes emojis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just on Twitter. Uh, so I want to hear about the day that Kate Blanchett came to Austin. <laughs> you took her around. Do you remember we went on a practice run for that? Yes. <laughs> it was this, like, anyway, not here. Not here. <laughs> I was trying to. I was trying. I mean, there's fucking Kate Blanchett's coming. So I asked my niece for bar recommendations because she's much cooler than me. Um, she told me this really cool bar to go to. I went in. Music was deafening. It was just a den of hipsters, like the Austin. There were. You know how when you see influencers in the wild and they're just exceptionally shiny and you, you wonder how that happened, but good for you guys. Um, yeah, it was full of them. So we're like, I met you outside and we're like, we just, just go get pizza. Fuck it. I'm taking her to the gay bar, um, <laughs> which is what happened. Yeah, we went for coffee. I, I, and I took her to the gay bar and there was a code on my phone that we'd set it up with because everybody was super excited i don't know how those fucking queers kept their mouths shut but they did but uh yeah if i was going to take her there um one of the guys was going to send me a, a message saying hey can you cover for me thursday and if she was coming to the bar i would say yes and if not no or no answer means no so yeah i i don't know and then i blacked out i think i overshared and cried on her a little bit at some point but it, that That definitely happened. Um, I forgot to get her a taco. One goddamn thing she asked for. And I, it was Monday night at 11 o'clock and 
how is bomb tacos not open it's always open not open so yeah i it, i don't know i blacked out do you should, should we explain why cape land <laughs> <laughs> i mean i guess that's probably a better intro this is like reading one of my essays you never know where it starts <laughs> um yeah they they called me my agents called me it was monday morning i'd gotten off work at like I don't know, four o'clock, walked Teddy, went to bed, probably watched TV a little bit too. And I had class at 10, my phone rang at like nine and they're like asking me if they could give Kate Blanche my phone number and I hung up on them. Um, <laughs> it's a ridiculous question. Um, and then at some point during class realized they might've been serious and called him back. Um, yeah, and then we just, it, I don't, the whole thing is ridiculous. She kept, you don't want to explain time zones to Kate um, as a thing. So she, she said she'd call it 11 and I'm like doing the math, 5 a.m. Sure, perfect, perfect. We can do 5 a.m., that's fine. So yeah, I don't know. She's easy to be around, she's warm and funny and nice, but it. Uh, I don't know. That's not supposed to happen in, you know, I fantasized a lot more about, well, also my Oscar speech, but um, like the things you practice when you're kids, it's never, that's that's not what being a writer is supposed to be. It was just, I don't know. I had no way to prepare for that. It was fun though. I mean, it's one of those things that like was, was thrilling to be even like vaguely adjacent to it as the, as the, <laughs> Listen, in terms of like going around during the first run, yeah. under no circumstances could I be considered Kate Blanchett's stunt double? <laughs> but I got a chance to. <laughs> it was the greatest. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing was just, I don't know. I'm, I have really good friends. Like everybody has kept that secret for four years now. So yeah, I yeah I, I don't know I have really good friends so that's and then nice. I just asked you I just like blurted it out <laughs> I'm in secrets out now. now so, so um can I ask you some questions from the Q&A because I think there are some good ones oh. I, will read, I will read them beforehand so I don't like if they take a weird turn in the middle I won't <laughs> um uh did you have to shop this book around or did publishers recognize its brilliance right away? <laughs> uh, no, I had that obscenely cool thing happen to me that i seen from Julie and Julia. Um, I woke up Sunday morning and my DMs were full of editors wanting to see it. Um, agents, I already had an agent. Thank God, um, it's not really a great time to be searching for one. And didn't have a website up. Please listen to Roxanne Gay. She is not fucking kidding. Have a website with <laughs> some sort of contact information because I had, I had, I threw my niece a hundred dollars, like go through my DMs and send me everything that was important. I was just bombarded. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Tim O'Connell at, at Knopf talked me into doing essays and I told him essays don't sell which is a weird thing to tell a book editor <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah it but sounded I think, fun but I think they do if you're good at them I mean I'm thinking of bad feminist and I know that Roxanne yeah. Gay is one of the one of the huge supporters of this book and they feel like, I mean, I feel like I had the same experience reading this book in which you just, you, you sit up straighter because you're so interested, not just in the things that are being described in the book, but also what the person has to say about them. Yeah, she's really good at moving you through an essay with cadence. Um, she's really good at that. 
Yeah, I I don't know. That's the conventional wisdom in strugglers writing groups is don't do essays. Essays don't sell. But I think boring essays don't sell. Maybe um, they were really fun to write. You can play. You can add so much interiority into an essay because it's 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 not going to get too tiring. Well, it's not that I've ever written a fucking short essay, but yeah, they're fun. I mean, I think writing things you don't believe in, those books don't sell. Yeah, those are unfortunate. Um, from Sabra Boyd, Lauren, I love your writing so much. Do you have any advice for overcoming fears of the legal implications of writing about parents or cults that might sue? Do I just need to accept that this comes with the cost of writing memoir, essays, and creative nonfiction? You know what the great thing about it is, is they give you a lawyer um, right before your book comes out. I had Dan Novick, who's awesome. And yeah, he, he they go through the whole book and point out anywhere you might possibly get sued, anywhere, everywhere you can change a name and fix it if you need to change a couple more details. And they'll talk you through everything. Um, I, it's... Some cults are more litigious than others. Um, mine doesn't have a prayer in court, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of the time writing about people. There, if you change a couple details and give them the benefit of at least deniability, they're not going to go announce themselves by suing you. So depends on the person, but but I also imagine that it would be hard to write anything meaningful if you were writing it the first draft with the fear. Yeah, it's just not something you really want to worry about. You, you have no risk of being sued until you publish it. So <laughs> you can write. <laughs> God, that's such great advice. You have no risk of anything until you publish it. <laughs> and, you know, and that means that yeah. you should take, you know, you should be as, as as brave and and um, and carefree as possible in the first draft. Yeah, I mean it's a great way to treat a book is throw everything you have into it, and everything. Don't try to save a story for the next book. Just <laughs> it'll it'll be fine. <laughs> Do you know what your next book is? I don't know. They want me to. We keep talking about writing about dogs because we think I could do it um, or it wasn't sentimental, but uh, I don't really know how to do that yet. So we're still at the staring at walls and trying sentences that don't lead to second sentences phase of that. I also, I, I know that often people say, the best advice I ever got was that before my first book came out, you should start on your second book. And I think, who could possibly do that? Um, bless your hearts. It seems yes, to they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> they're lying. That's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's nobody started a second book while they were waiting for their first book to come out. I think I yeah, I think they're yeah. lying. I I don't know. Well, everyone self-medicates differently, so maybe. <laughs> I love the fact, this is very sweet and all of the, they're all very sweet that because the chat is, um, has been disabled, most of the things in the questions are most, are like compliments and statements. Um, I love writers on Twitter. It seems to be a great place for writers to go when they should be writing. Yeah. Carol Dixonberg. Yep, that is correct. That it is. is true that is the biggest you're smart about it you carry a foot phone don't you i do see this is why you're putting out books phone. all the time do you do you do you never mind no like <laughs> i don't know we should talk i don't know just do all right so some of these dipshits are here for me and like um, I think they're all... may not may not know <laughs> 
I mean, I know how amazing you are. Um, Elizabeth has a book out called The Souvenir Museum. And if you like short stories and perfect lines that'll crack you up, like people being pollinated. Um, <laughs> should look at that. Right. Thanks, Lauren. But 100% right. of the dipshits and the lovely <laughs> I should say, <laughs> and what are the dipshits? It's fine. Like they're my people. We know. Um, here's a lovely question um, from Elizabeth Stokes. I was really moved by the party scene toward the end, where you're feeding your friends in a house that you own, and I was thinking about how hungry and sheltered bit you'd been not that long before. Was there a moment when you realized that you'd be okay, that you have enough to eat, a safe place to stay, etc., where you should? you could pretty much count on that to some degree going forward. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the beginning of the pandemic was great because I had like three months of food stocked up already because that's how I live because I'm fucking terrified. I drive a car with a sleeping bag and a mat in the back of it which works out well when the VA fucks up and schedules you for your shot in Austin, because I could drive down there and maybe poop in some cow fields and uh, sleep in the back of my car and go. But yeah, I'm, I'm never, I don't, I, I hope that goes away at some point, but I don't know that it does. And then you got caught here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the worst place. Yeah, it's true. Do you have a favorite essay in the book? Essay of someone else's. That's from Andy Johnson. I was wondering whether you have, if there's a piece in the book that is dear to you. Uh, <laughs> I can hear Maggie. Um, I know she's on the other side. I of love her so much. I just... Oh, my, my presence was requested and now I'm on the other side. I love that cat so much. <laughs> yep, that's that's what she was doing outside the door. She's really loud. Uh, essay, favorite. I don't know. I, I think I, I go back and forth between leaving as an artist thing, which was not supposed to be the title of the book. It was just something I named the file because, and then in cell block, but uh, the one about jail, I think it's called cell block. Um, probably that one. I think I, I got to be a little bit weird, which was fun. Um, I love that essay. I and mean, how do you describe losing your mind? It was great because I was kind of losing it too. Like if this was uh, April, May, the pandemic, when it was starting to get to me that I was just sitting there alone and I wasn't entirely sure that was my neighbors talking or there was, I just, and it was, I just have this paranoia about it now. Like, when are you going to hear voices again? Because holy fuck, um, that would be unpleasant. Yeah, I'm glad Teddy was around for that one. But yeah, it's it's uh it was fun to write. It was fun to just kind of, all right, sure, let's go down this fucking rabbit hole. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I don't know. I like that I said. So that's a great answer. I also feel like in, in reading it, like it came, it's a surprise, it feels like a surprise in the book. That's a it's a because the, not to, I mean, to, to keep on talking about how much I love this book, but the no, individual essay, I'll just keep going. Stop. I'm going to make you, I'm going to try to make you cry one way or the other. Um, um, but the, 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 that essay comes at, like, at just the right time in the book. But the essays are individually terrific, but it's also a great book like they're they they build um and turn um yeah you should all i think that that there have probably been many links to buy the book um i so i have a, a uh here's a question from reagan arthur 
<laughs> Hi, Reagan. She just happens to be here. Lauren, I think the location is a painful one, and I've loved your transparency about it on Twitter. What's been the happiest surprise of it all so far? I, I missed the first part, making a weird face, because <laughs> I was making a weird face, and it crunched my ear. Whoa, sorry. Okay. These things happen. <laughs> um, I know the path of publication is a painful one, and I've loved oh. your transparency about it on Twitter. What's been the happiest surprise of it all so far? You know, I really thought, I mean, you know how damn well I have this imposter syndrome, especially since I haven't gotten to school or anything. Um, and I thought at some point I would be surrounded by people who were intent on making sure they knew they were smarter than me or, you know, were the old guard in New York public. It hasn't been like that at all. It's, it's a bunch of us fucking around on Twitter watching the same TV show. It's been, my editor giggles on the phone, like a 16 year old sometimes when I shock him, he's fun. Yeah, it's not, when when I thought of agents, I thought they would be like the Hollywood agents depicted in TV. It's everybody's just been book people and they're fucking great. I love book people. Y'all y'all are who I wanted to hang out with. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> like honestly, that's that's been the thing is I I don't know. Reagan's showing up to watch this thing pretty great. it's pretty fucking cool do you know what i always think of when i hear, hear the term imposter syndrome um and i'm i'm telling the story because i remember that you and i met outside the jericho brown reading when he came to read at ut and it was like one of those amazing readings where oh i God. felt like when I was sitting there, I was thinking 20 years from now, I'm gonna say, yeah, I was in that room for that reading. Roger Reeves introduced him. It was just like this beautiful literary, it was night, it was so great. And I think after that, I was talking to somebody, a young writer who's good friends with Jericho Brown, who told me that he had said to Jericho, I am suffering from some imposter syndrome, really an incredibly talented writer named Matthew Kennedy. Um, no, God, Matthew Kelly, sorry, Matthew. I say that as though he shows up wherever I'm talking on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Kelly. You never know, it could <laughs> um, happen. So he, he's a really good friend of Jericho Brown's and he said, I have an imposter syndrome and that Jericho said, you don't have time for that. And every time I hear anybody talk about imposter syndrome, I want to say, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, right. I love it. God, that was good. You know, that was my first poetry reading. Was it really? Yeah, it was. It wasn't shit I had time to do. Like I maybe get an hour of TV and before I fall asleep, like I, this, yeah. there wasn't a life I led where I went to poetry readings or had friends who wanted to go to a poetry reading. Yeah, that was my first, and they're not all like that. <laughs> yeah, set the bar a little fucking high, dude. <laughs> Good one for your first. I should probably quit now, honestly. <laughs> like, just yeah. All right, I'm gonna go. Somebody says, "Is that pillow case?" She's really loud. Is that pillow cast case cat? We hear yes. That is Maggie the cat meowing on the other side of the door. Um, sorry, I'm looking through these nicks. <laughs> I love this. It's like, just saying hi, your book is awesome. Bought the book and the audio. <laughs> it when sitting, now listening to it on my commutes. Keep it down, y'all. We have five minutes. Come on. 
<laughs> what are some books you've read recently that you've loved? That's from Charlotte Prong. Uh, I mean, I've talked to a lot about Elon Green's book a lot, and it's it is truly fun and amazing. Um, I just picked up Brandon Taylor's Real Life. Um, I, uh, yeah, that one's. I don't know. I've also I have no attention span left, so I like shuffle between three different books at the same time, and I don't. I don't know what I'm reading. Then I don't know that I'm even reading them in order. Um, my brain's a little bit broken right now. I'm just liking sentences, yeah. I think. So, uh, yeah, Lydia Davis has been. Is it Lydia or Linda? I always forget. It's Lydia. Yeah. I have that at the top those, of my brain. I was talking about those, flash fiction with those entire friend. stories. Yeah, entire stories in one paragraph are yeah. perfect for me right now. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think I'm stuck with everybody else where I'm not, I'm not focusing all that well. I got to read Sandy Newman's new book though. Lucky, yeah, it's, it's so brilliant. Yeah, I think I have more gray hair because I read it. It's, I love her so much. <laughs> yeah, she's she's the best. Yeah, I don't want to go. Can you make Maggie say hi again? Yeah, here, hold yeah. on. So you should talk. All right, I'll just I'll, over here for I'll you. All right, get Maggie. <laughs> I'll narrate that this might be the least creepy room in Elizabeth's house but if you just look at that spread there and the nightmare fodder contained just stacked onto those shelves <sighs> looks like a painting I don't know now I'm supposed to just talk to myself this is a this was a really good idea for me to do <gasps> There she is. Oh my gosh. He might bite me at any moment. This is she's also this really is the kid I life. found. Oh my gosh, she's so big. I didn't look. Oh, yeah, okay. I know. Okay. I That's, know. Here you go, okay. No, I just wanted to see her. Okay, thank you. I'm so the last thing I'll say is that, oh, there's <laughs> Oh, please say we one last thing. We, got we all that. have bated breath for one last thing. <laughs> yep. Um, there's one last really good question. Yes, please. Are there any essays that you tried to write but couldn't quite make for this book? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, there are so many. Um, I have one that I've been working on for, about Dolly Parton for like a year now. Um, I used to write her fan mail and it's a really good story and I I want to make it something, but I don't know what to do with it yet. So we're just playing with that. There's one about dogs. I've I I have a hundred dead files for that book, but I I just didn't fit the the arc or what I was trying to say. So you can only yeah, there's there's only so much that'll fit in those pages. The next book. We'll see. It's so great to see you. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh my gosh, my total pleasure. This actually feels real and it's so <laughs> fucking cool because I know you, I've met you, you're real. I, it's That's true. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Showing up on the TV next time. We'll, um, uh, next time in course, Austin, maybe. Of With course. Michael and Leela and whoever else is around. Edward. Yes, Maggie. Maggie. Obviously. And we here at Politics and Prose really want to thank both Lauren Huff and Elizabeth McCracken and our audience out there for chiming in with these truly amazing, engaging questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this, in type, this type of programming. And we really couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So we really hope you'll follow the link in the chat to get your copy of Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing or visit politics-pros.com. I also can't wait for the Dolly Parton essay. I'm ready for that <laughs> one. Um, while you're there, check out our events calendar for the latest and greatest from us and from our shelves to yours. We hope everyone out there is staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. 
and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.